promote this sport or actually we just need to sit and watch the game and give the honest analysis? I think what we've done helped with that. I think uh, RTE showing it live on TV is, is brilliant for, for young girls and I think it's important for young boys as well to be able to see that, that female players can play the World Cup and it's going to be shown for everyone to see and I think we've done a good job. I think RTE have done amazing. The coverage across RTE and TG Cahar has been fantastic and I really enjoyed working on it. As Louise said, we would have preferred to be there mm. but to be able to be here and promote football, particularly with our European qualifiers coming up in the next few months, it was fantastic to be able to do that. Louise, you're playing with several of the Dutch players who played in the final on Sunday with Arsenal. You know a lot of these players from playing around the Super League as well. Have you got any sense of what it's like now in England in terms of the momentum from their run to the semi-finals, in terms of the interest levels, in terms of what awaits you when you get back to Arsenal? Yeah, I'm still I'm, yeah, I'm very curious myself. Yeah, I'll be heading back in a, in a few days for pre-season. Um, but yeah, it just I just think it's just going to explode. You know, I thought just how... Obviously, the Dutch girls represent themselves. The English girls, you know, they're obviously going to come back a bit disappointed. The Scots as well. So I'm going to have some angry teammates for a little while. But uh, Angry Scots? Angry Scots, I know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just... And, you know, now there's a, there's a new sponsor in the league as well, Barclay. So I just feel the game is just growing massively and it's going to be so, so fast. And, uh, yeah, no, hopefully, you know, hopefully we can all kind of... Uh, I'm definitely going to just tag along with some of the, the Dutch and the English and just be, eh, I'm, <laughs> we're here too, yeah, yeah, just yeah. tag along, yeah, yeah. Well, I th you're not really going to be tagging along either because I think the spotlight is firmly coming on the Irish team because obviously the Americans won the World Cup and you're going to be their first opponents as world champions. Yeah, we, we have a little trip to LA, hopefully um, soon. And yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's absolutely massive. Um, the Rose Bowl, 92,000. Yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. I've done that. Yeah, I've done half of that, which is all right. Um, but no, that's a. Uh, it's it's incredible, and it's it's something brilliant for us as well. Coming into the coming into the Euros, at least we can kind of come together as a as a team, and I think that's probably one of the more kind of important things. But yeah, hopefully, if I can try nutmeg Alex Morgan or probably have a chat with Rampino and all that, you know, what I mean, it'd just be yeah, it'd be it'd be great. But it's a uh, what an get that viral first. moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Stephanie, do you think this is a sea change this month with the coverage of the Women's World Cup for women's football? Yeah, I think we've been talking about it all month, I suppose, everywhere I go. I think it's great to hear, like I've had men from in the bar saying to me, oh, did you watch the match? It's not that you see the women's game. I think it's, it's really important to change people's perception. And I think for me with female sports stars, it's kind of a generational thing. So for us doing this now with the younger generation, in generations to come, it's going to be normalised. And so I think it's just important now that that everybody can see it and also that it's been a good tournament. I think mm. people can compare, always compare it to the men's game. It's always going to be compared to it. But I think if you look at the group stages, we had some games where obviously USA and Thailand where it was a big gulf in class, but you get that in the men's game too. So look, I think it's brilliant. I think it's great that people are getting to see what we can do. And obviously, as I said, it's good for us coming up to the European Championships because hopefully the people who are watching those games can now come and watch us and, and grow and support our last qualifying campaign. We had a lot of good crowds at Tallis Stadium, thanks to the likes of Aviva and Three who have helped really push it. But again, yeah, it's, it's always going to be good for us if we have a lot of people wanting to watch football and, and wanting to see us play. Unfortunately, this is Irish football, so while the rest of the world is really celebrating women's football and getting excited about the future and the possibilities, we're in the grips of a crisis at the association from top to bottom, it seems, and then the manager walks out, what, two months before the start of your qualification campaign? Like we were talking about it on the radio on Saturday, just the disappointment levels that... Like, are you concerned that actually in this country we're not in a position to capitalise on the interest levels that are now there? A little bit. I think it's it's our job as players to make sure that we don't go backwards. I think a lot of the girls within the squad have taken that on, upon their shoulders. I think if you've seen what happened in 2017, we've got a really, really good tight-knit group of players and even some of the players who have retired recently, we're all very, very close. And I think we're all pushing to make sure it doesn't go back because we've seen that happen in the past and we've seen where it can end up. And for us, I think personally, I can only speak for myself, but I think I'm speaking for the team when I say that we want things to improve. And I think here in Ireland, we've always had this attitude of, I sure didn't they do their best. But for me and for the players, it's, it's what can we do better? And how can we get better? And how can we get to these major tournaments? And if we're going to do that, it has to be a very, very good appointment. It can't be somebody that's brought in to kind of keep things ticking over as they say I think it has to be a really important appointment and the next game coming up is against the world champions as you say on 
only the American can have a victory tour, really, can't they? It's something they do. But yeah, I think that's an important game before our qualifier. So you'd like to hope. I don't think they will have a manager sewn up by then and then we can prepare for the, for the Montenegro game, which is the most important. But um, it is a difficult time, I think, and it's something that as players we have to make sure that um, it does go the right way and that it doesn't go backwards. As players, you shouldn't have to grow the game in a way, aside from just going out and playing the game and being inspirational on the pitch. It feels as though maybe we were asking too much of you that just because the FAI is in crisis, you seem to have to step up and fill in the gaps and get out and about and make sure that actually people are capitalising on the attention that's there right now, whereas like, that's probably not really your job. Oh, yeah, sure, look, but if you need something done right, you have to ask the women to do it. Well, now it's, um, I think it is something it is, like we do, we've, and we've all looked at each other, especially from everything that happened a couple of years ago, we do, you know, we've all realised that everything that each individual does is very important and everyone's opinions matter and everyone's, you know, everyone's voice is heard, you know, in our squad, even if they're the new players coming up, you know, we make sure to, to let them know kind of what we've been through and what, what our team represents and, and it is a lot, you know, it's, it's always fight. We're battling on the pitch all the time as well. And um, yeah, I think it's just something that it is something that we all need to, to relish and take that bit of responsibility. And I think then, you know, it's a, it's a good shared load and we're all, you know, we're all in the, in the same boat. Mm. But um, yeah, listen, it's not an ideal situation, but exactly we would just want to hear, we just want to step up and, and yeah, take on that responsibility of of being role models and just and just do our job on the pitch you know some of the stuff that we hear like you know we we just take some of it as as background noise now because we've just got to we know that we've got to look at ourselves to be able to perform on the pitch and to be in the best condition that we can be on the pitch and you know because that's at the end of the day that's you know that's where it counts most for us We've really enjoyed over probably the last six, nine months and off the ball, we've really increased our horse racing coverage and we've had so many interesting people in the studio over the last while, a mix of men and women and so many people, Jessica, to come in and talk about the horse racing industry that it's one of those industries that for a long time there was no real sexism, that everybody was treated the same, that there were generally similar opportunities for men and women. Yeah. Was that how you found it? Yeah, similar opportunities, but very few women in it. Uh, the majority of the people training, when I started training, which was 30 years ago, there were very few women trainers, there were very few women jo jockeys. Um, and, you know, you, you, you know, I just remember little things like, you know, the owners wanted to speak to my husband, they didn't want to speak to me. I was a woman, what would I know? You know, it's the usual thing. And, and what did it's you just, say? Uh, I didn't say anything because I spoke to him. And he <laughs> said... <laughs> He wouldn't so, have a clue what was going on. <laughs> and he didn't have a clue what was going on. But, like, it's got a lot better. Like, when I started, you know, all, even all the people who ran racing, there were very few people in the back, background that ran racing, the officials on the race courses, they were all men. And slowly, now it is an awful lot better now. But it's taken a long time um, to acknowledge. And, you know, what have I done? I've just kept on my head down, decided I had to work harder than anyone else because that's the only way you get on, and then just keep going. Because I think, you know, Katie, you, you had to fight to, for riding as well as Kate did. You, you were a bit ahead of her. But it's, you know, it's hard to um, you know, get started, because people would overlook it, you're just a girl. But there's some of the, the best riders now in Ireland are girls. You know, yeah. they really are. And they, every they come numbers. before. And I'm going to try and make the best trainers women. <laughs> and there's a good few of us now. We're going to we're going to we're going to succeed. You're about to take over. I'm going to you're, take you're over. You're already taking over. So. <laughs> I don't know about that. We've got we've got a long way to go yet. Yeah. Um, but we're going to get there. Um, you know, I think it's it's important. Even though, as you say, it's it's probably one of the few sports that men and women do on a totally equal footing. There is no. There are some women races there, uh, and men riders races, but you know, basically the whole thing is on an equal footing. You have you're on the same level. You have to beat them, and Kate, that's a great thing. Yeah, Kate, you're involved sort of in both sides of the track, and you're very much involved in the training side as well. Mm. Like, was your sense always that the opportunities were there? 
I was very fortunate. I kind of fell into it. I was much more um, in the eventing side of things. And when I was 17, mum let me ride um, the retired race race Moscow Flyer um, in a charity race. And I kind of course I got put on I don't know how I was led on this amazing ex race horse and he came out of retirement to raise money for charity and I was allowed to ride him at Punchtown Festival and of course he obliged and won for me and you know I got the bug then and what age were you? Uh, 17 right. <laughs> still in school and I think I the day before I failed my driver's test <laughs> for going <laughs> <laughs> left instead of right. I think I kept going. He kept telling right me to go. Horse, though, so. yeah, he kept t- telling me to go right, and I kept going left. <laughs> but I, I knew the right way around Punchstown on him uh, the next day. But um, it's kind of I think when you start out riding horses, even from when you're a kid in pony club, it's always the girls against the boys. It was never kind of I never knew any different. Like you always just competed against the boys and tried to beat them. But definitely when you go into the weigh room and stuff. The ladies' changing room is a tiny little, maybe if you went to Roscommon, it's improved now, but it was a little prefab out the back and um, you see, you, there was no women valets. You go into the lads' changing room to get your saddle and everything. Um, but as mum said, you just had to go out there and beat them. And I was very lucky when I first started riding, I had uh, Katie and Nina to look up to and they definitely looked after me. Yeah, Katie. <laughs> You looked after her well? A big Apparently time. so. She's, well, like, yeah. <laughs> and she still hasn't passed her driving test. <laughs> <laughs> I had, just about. <laughs> um, no, we were, I, this is an extremely lucky, fortunate to uh, have grown up around horses yeah. and, and like definitely started halfway up the ladder, whereas a lot of people have to start at the bottom. Um, we had opportunities at home. Dad trained horses and they were always there. I was lucky enough, but like Kate, I did the eventing and the show jumping as well and then decided that I'd like to maybe ride in a couple of races and I went down and I got my license and I ended up um, riding a couple of amateur races and then I kind of got the bug and I got hooked and I liked it and I liked the speed and I liked everything about it and it was just... It was our way of life and it was being in the yard every day with the horses I didn't ever think that the, my career would go the way that it went um, I loved working outside and I loved being part of it and then opportunities started to happen and I was like kind of you get that taste of winning and you just want more and it's 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 addictive and uh, but then they don't come without opportunities then you have to deliver as well and um, I was lucky enough a couple of things came the right way but it was always I'd never remember it being ladies and we're very lucky in our industry that it's not separate that we was always I was always of the mentality that um, you know if 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 you feel that um, you're a woman within the sport um, go and do something else if you're going to single yourself out just because you're female you know what I mean get stuck in get the job done you went out with the lads you rode with the lads you came back in but then you wanted to be the girl that got changed that went home but out there I didn't we didn't look for any special treatment or nor would I give it back you know someone would cut the snot off of you you'd cut the snot off of them you had to fight your corner (laughs) and literally you had to fight your corner and get stuck in come back in have the row have the words you shouldn't have gone there you shouldn't have done that you know, and it was, it was, that's the way it was, but that's the way you wanted to be. I wanted to be treated like the lads. You wanted to look like one of the lads. It was scary. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted well, to look like them on the track, but then when you came off the track, you wanted to have a shower and get changed. You looked like a girl going home. <laughs> that was, that was the ideal scenario. Well, well, just on that point then, what you're talking about, maybe facilities. So you say you always wanted to be treated the way the lads were, but they're going back into their changing room where it's probably constantly being improved and you're going back into prefabs. Uh, no, everything it's, has come on. It's, yeah. come, on, it's, come, on it's come on huge. It's come on huge. But th- to say when we first started out, there was a lot less, like, ba- not great facilities. But each race course, every single year, we're always, always improving them. And they are, they're getting on par with the lads now. Hmm. Ted, I don't think you were ever going to stop her doing anything she ever wanted to do. I'm just glad she didn't start riding motorbikes. <laughs>
<laughs> however, however bad it is to watch her going out in the national over 40 fences on a horse that you know is a safe convenience, to watch her doing 180 miles an hour around the corner, I definitely would have hit the bottle. Because, uh, there's still time, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think what, what their two were doing was a dangerous enough sport, but they liked it and they loved it. I never looked at it upon it as danger, uh, but they enjoyed it and uh, they were lucky. Both of them had great success at it and loved doing it. Katie was a little bit older than Kate and herself and Nina were the same age group. Nina was there maybe 12 months before and they were pals and they were able to back one another up. But it was great. It was, it was, it was great. I, I never, I must say, once uh, herself and Ruby were riding the, in the national, that's a few years ago now, and I just watched them as they lined up for 40 horses. And we had two of them, Helen and myself, were standing looking at one another and I said, Jesus, do we, do we need this? Do you know, here's, whatever about Ruby, like, do I need this little darling of mine? <laughs> Set, setting off down over 40 fences on a horse, like, and, 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 and I couldn't, you know, I, I must say, in those occasions now, uh, and especially if she, if she got a fall, lucky enough, she got very little injuries. He, got, he, took, her, he took her share of injuries, <laughs> that's for sure. She got very little injuries. But I don't know if I could have, if I could have actually... I used to run down when he got a fall to see if he was all right. I don't know if I could have ran down with a, with a, with a heavy heart if she was lying under a horse. I know loads of lads do it. And loads of, I'm thankful that she enjoyed what she did and loved what she did and got out of it in, in one piece, which most people do. Uh, and the same way what I think in all ladies in sport, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned. I always look at girls as female girls. I hate to see them doing dirty jobs. I hate to see him lifting big old heavy loads. And I'm not a male chauvinist. If the ramp at the box has to be put up, I don't want Katie or Kate put it up. I want myself or Stephen or someone else put it up. The same way if I want it, it's a dirty job in the yard. I don't want them doing it. They're well able to do it. Katie drove the box the other day and she's expecting a baby in October. The driver didn't turn up and she drove, the, she's a HDV license. She took four horses to Roscommon. We were stuck. But that's... And if there was a tyre to be changed on the side of the road, there's no better woman to do it. <laughs> but I wouldn't want her doing it. I mean, she's well able to do it and she wouldn't be stuck and Kate's the same way. And there's no tougher woman in my life than Jessie Harrington. No better looking woman, but no... <laughs> but, no but no tougher woman. I saw Jessie ride, Jessie myself around the same cut and go, and I knew it was very valley with her brother John, and I saw her ride in event, and she represented Ireland in the Olympics. She was a tough woman, riding over jumps and fences and got plenty of bad falls, and she's an absolute... She's a role model now for all you young girls that are here, and I'm old enough to be most of your grandfathers. <laughs> she's a role model for any girl, because... It's a tough game that she really cracked it in because training horses, like she said, her husband, Johnny, and J Jesse was always driving the bus. Even though fellas thought that Johnny might have been driving it, Jesse was always driving the bus. So, and Jesse was the boss as such. But she's that type of woman. She's a great, a great ambassador for females. I didn't realise when I'm coming here tonight there was a, a female do. I thought it was a sporting do. But <laughs> look around here. <laughs> It is a sporting do. <laughs> it, 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 is a, it is a sporting do with the majority of females. But I mean, I'm, I, as I said, I'm, I, I have uh, two daughters and seven grandchildren and all the grandchildren are girls. So I'm completely surrounded by women in my house. <laughs> and they're all strong women. My mother was a strong woman. Uh, she wouldn't be long about telling you what to do or what not to do. She was strong. She was well able for my father. Uh, he was a kind and gentle man. And... Uh, as if, the other day, someone said that uh, if, if you see uh, 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 a cross man or a, a disappointed looking man, you just have to look around and see a man that doesn't understand what he's done wrong and a woman looking at him. <laughs> and, that's, and that's usually what it is in our, in our thing. But I think that's, that, that's a... I think it's a wonderful sport, ours in general, because it gives everyone a chance to ride. I came up with two girls in particular, the Rooney girls. The father was a very famous rider, Willie Rooney, and Anne Ferris and Rosemary Stewart, as they were later words. They were two Rooney girls, and they were two hard birds. They would have you for your breakfast, morning, noon, and night. If you poked there, they'd cut the snot off you. They were definitely tough. Jesse would back that up, weren't you? Yes.
definitely. They, they were, were definitely, you know, they um, were before their time. Yeah. And then there was Jessica Willis on after that. And then along came Katie and Nina. And there was plenty as well. Anne Collin wrote a Galway plate winner. The two Rooney girls, Anne Ferris, wrote a national winner years ago and a Ladbroke Hurl winner. When women, there were only two girls riding. And before that then, girls were riding in point of points and races, but they were confined to ladies' races. And uh, I would mean, say even in Jessie's time, when, if Jessie applied for a licence when she was 18 or 19, I don't think she'd have got one. No, I wouldn't have got one. No. Definitely. The, the, and also the other thing is you probably don't realise that um, 50 years ago, women weren't allowed to hold a trainer's licence. That's right. They had to fight to get a trainer's licence because they were deemed... A lady in England took the British Jockey, Jockey Club actually to the High Court and said, why can't I have a licence? And they then relented. And over here, there were people like Mrs. Nolan, Mrs. St. John Nolan. Yeah. She couldn't hold a license, so it was held by the head lad Anne in Biddle. their yard and Anne Biddle the yeah. same. And, you know, it was... And I can remember that. I know I'm old, but, you know, it really was 50 years ago uh, that they weren't even allowed to have a license. So, you know, and the same thing with ladies. The, yeah. their, their own jockeys, they were allowed to ride in ladies' point of points. And then finally they were allowed to then ride in in races, and then they weren't sure when they actually rode in races whether they're going to call them jockeys or jockettes. There was actually <laughs> a thing in the paper. There was a discussion, if you actually Google it, how, when all the sort of history of it, and they said, well, we're not sure whether we're going to call them jockeys or jockettes. You know, and we look now and think it's absolutely crazy. You know, how did this ever start? But we've got there, I think. We're getting there. Oh, you're there. Yeah, you're there well and <laughs> truly. I think if we take one thing from tonight, it's that we're all going to use cut the snot off you far more often in our everyday vote. Is, is, that, a, is that a regular one in the Walsh household? Ah, no, it's a regular word. It's no, a, it's but you know what it means. Yeah. 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 Right. You don't have to be in racing to know when somebody cuts the snot off you. <laughs> Whether you're riding a bike or more from a car or whatever you're doing, if somebody cuts the snot off you, you know exactly what it means. So there's a few other words you could use as well, but that's about as, as good a so, one yeah. as you could use, you know? Mm. How important was the sibling rivalry, Katie? Like, you look at now, and well, he's just retired, but when Ruby was still winning big races up to three, six months ago and you'd get to interview him after the race and there was like such a bond and such a, you could see just the closeness between you. Was there ever a period where it was... No, was a, there was never... A bit of niggle? No, never, I must say. Um, we were at different Ruby's... 40 now, you know, so when he was, he was, we were riding at two different sectors and as my career went on then we rode in a good few races together but because with racing is such a leveller, you don't get a chance to be cocky when you're involved in racing. You don't get a chance to be I am here, I have arrived because what happens is you go out and you give something a bad ride in the next race and you're back down the bottom again. You're two strides away, you're one minute you're getting a pat on the back saying well done, you were brilliant and the next minute someone goes you were way out of line there. What were you doing? You know, so it's, it only takes a half an hour to bring you straight back down. You. Yeah, well, who said that to you? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all know. I think we all know. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, that's what was, that was, what is super about it is that you just don't get a chance to run away with yourself. So, and because Ruby got so many falls and, and he was lucky through injury as well and to be able to retire the way he did was extremely lucky. But I suppose the big days it's so hard to ride those winners and so much goes into it from a jockey's point of view from a trainer's point of view and you're so much involved and you see what happens and I know people like people that don't understand race and I'm sure it's the same in every sport it's it all comes down to that one day and so much has to go right and when it all does go right it's just the best feeling in the world and you can't buy it you know what I mean you cannot put a price on it you can't buy it and, and there's plenty of women in here who felt that feeling and it's just it's an unbelievable you know that sense of where you just lose it for a couple of minutes so to see Ruby lose it for a couple of minutes after riding a, a big winner you know it's it's lovely to see it because you've tasted it and you know what it's like and to see someone get the kick out of it they should be getting the kick out of it and still at 39 or 40 like he yeah. was it was as if it was his first one all over again and I think when that goes off for you you feel like, you know, I've come to the end of this, you know. But for him, to those, it was all about the big winners for him towards the end of it. And to see him get that rush, you know, I was getting it, you know, because I was getting it off of him. I felt like, right. yeah, you know, so it was just, it was great. 
I, I love seeing people, you know, lose it and really appreciate it. And because it's so hard, like sport is so hard and you have to appreciate the good days because there's so many, so many average bad days. You need to appreciate the good days. There's yeah, so, there's so many bad days. <laughs> Unreal. You mentioned there the, the number of injuries that Ruby had and Ted, you touched on as well, like having to walk down or run down and see if he's okay. Like, were you aware of how your dad felt about you getting injured, of how he didn't want to face Definitely that sort of walk? Very much, very much. And I was very much aware when I was watching and, you know, and that's what I know it's a completely different brand of people in this room here. But in racing, you, you, you're, there's an awful lot of people who back horses and all they want is they're thinking of their few quid whether it be their five or their ten or whatever it may be and you know I look at it once everyone's okay you know once everyone gets up and and they walk away and I know what it's like sitting on the couch at home watching Ruby ride in a race or watching any jockeys ride and he get a fall and you know by the way they land and I we, we know but the way the different people fall and the different way they move, you get to know a person's body. Like I, I'm sh the four of us here. When you, what, you wouldn't even need a paper. I could pick out who's riding nearly what horse where. Mm -hmm. I know by their style. I know by the way they hold their back or the way they hold their head or their legs or the way they go over a fence. I know who it is. I don't have to look it up and go, "There's such and such," or "There's Kate," or "There's Jessie," or "There's mm -hmm. Ted." You, you know by looking at them. So you know when they hit the ground, the way they move, you kind of go, "He's okay," or you kind of go. I didn't like that. I don't like that. Then you see the screens come up and it's, mm. it's horrendous when you see the screens come up and you're sitting on the couch, you, f you, and I, you feel so far away and all you want to know is, is he all right? All you want to know is, A, is he mentally okay? Can he talk? And can he move his legs? They're the two things. After that, the rest will fix. Everyone says, horrific injuries. He broke his leg. When we hear he break his leg, and I know you might think it sounds crazy, we go, that'll fix you know, that's not life ending, you know, but if they're unconscious or they can't feel their, you know, from the waist down, that's when you're into, that's when it's different story. And I think, and it's, it's only a couple of minutes, but it feels like forever. It feels like, will someone just ring? Does anyone know the photographer down at the last men's? Ring him and see, is he up? Like the amount of phones that would ring and go, yeah, listen, he's moving, he's sore, or I'm not sure he's been taken off, whoever it may be. So when I got a fall, you know, we, we were always taught, if you fall, if you're not serious hurt, jump up straight away. Like, yeah. because yeah. it was like, oh. to let the other person yeah. know that. Yeah. And if, by God, if you got down, you were a little bit winded, it'd be like, you're what? Get up. <laughs> Get up. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. And there was nothing wrong with you. You were a little bit winded and a little bit sore. But you hadn't broken anything, really, and you weren't going to die. So cop yourself on, get up, yeah. <laughs> and you'll, you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> So he's telling you that, but he doesn't want you doing any hard work. No, you know what I mean, though. When you put it into, when you put it into, no, there's no better man. You know, he's. Uh, it was. Um, it was always extremely fair. There was no one forced down the road of horse racing. Anyone could have done whatever they wanted to do, and uh, once they were well behaved and, and turned up for work on time, it was. It was. It was. Uh, it was. It was always great support. First man to get stuck into you and tell you what you've done wrong. But as soon as that's done, and men are great for that. Uh, they will get stuck into you and uh, then it'll be done and over and dusted and five minutes later it'll be all forgotten about which is great there's nothing worse than a than someone trying to tell you off over a couple of days you know yeah. what i mean you know with like with dad it's just he'll lose it and then uh all's all's good then defend the yourself one. here That's what I do. <laughs> you're, you're getting the battery here it. yeah i uh, know i tell you it's just it's just it's just a, it's your reaction it's like the lads you see sitting standing at the end of the pitch roaring at fellas and then they go down and put their arms around another inside in the dressing room afterwards at the spur of the moment thing you're better off there's nothing worse and in life and especially for all the young people is brooding something if you have something to say say the bloody thing don't be humming and hamming about will I tell him, will I not tell him. Whether, whatever it is, even in personal life, dodging the bullet, going around the corner, I let him know tomorrow. Tell him. I'm sick of you. I'm fed up of you. Out of my life. Or, you know what I mean? Don't be. You know what I mean? That's it. Don't be beating around the bush. And the same way, we, know, we were just always the same way. Just get it out and get it done. My father, Arthur Merson, wasn't great at doing that. And we'd maybe give on a bags of a ride in Listole. Now, for those of you, Listole is a good bit away from where I live in this. And you get into the car, and I'd say, that didn't go great. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's Listole. We'd arrive in Limerick, which is about an hour and a half later, and I'd say, like a cup of tea, no. <laughs> 
and we'd arrive maybe a bit further. There was no junction 14s or any of them at the time. We might get as far as Port Leash. I said, would you, would you like an ice cream? No. <laughs> and the next day he said, the next day, like, you'd rich a brood, like, and he said, is that the best you can do? <laughs> I'd say, no, it's not, but I, that's the thing. But, like, instead of, like, saying, that was a cock up and that, that, get it out, the journey home would have been, that time, just always a good old drive. He wouldn't say anything now. He was a kind man, and he never would. He was a lot nicer fellow than I am, and a lot a better man, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But he was, he was, he just wouldn't, he, that's what he was, he wouldn't. I, I, but my mother, on the other hand, or my uncle Ted, would say to you straight away and get it out, and it always was better. The same way as someone got a fall in our place, as Jesse would tell you, and if he didn't, if he wasn't hurt, you'd want him to grab the horse before the horse galloped off. <laughs> Get up and grab him. Exactly. And he used to say, a fella, fella fall with Brendan Sheridan, who wrote for me, was said, a young fella got a fall one day and he was lying on the ground. Now, he got a soft enough fall and he fell down. And next minute, the horse galloped off and someone said, this is hurt. And Brendan says, I hope he is. Because <laughs> if he's not, he says, your man will kill him when he gets to let the horse go. <laughs> when I got to him, I said, oh, oh. I said, what's wrong with you? I'm winded, winded like, do you mean winded like? I mean, God bless us and save us. The horse at this stage now has disappeared into the, if you're on the coral like, he's disappeared three miles away. Instead, instead of grabbing up and grabbing him, it's like, and it's the same way in all aspects of life, and all pressure all the train, but they were, but as I said again, Jesse was, was great and Jesse's brother, that kind of a family, you just sort of like, you don't want a whinge. And if you have it to say, a whinge or a whinge. And the same way, if you're in our sport, I don't know about all, all sports, but in our sport, if you're a bit squeamish, do something else. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, it's not for you. Do you know what I mean? And there's no point in blaming somebody on this. Now, that's the only thing I must say, and you're a great soccer player, probably one of the best in the world as, a fe as female goes. And I know it's part of the game, but I think it's terrible when I see them taking the, taking the dives. Do you know, the you think, yeah, I just think, I think it's terrible. I, I watch it and I know that, and, and they're only waiting for the fella to get a yellow card. It's all part of the game. And if he gets two yellow cards, he's gone. You know, and maybe if he's a good player and you want to get him put off. I actually but I loved think, watching the women because I, I thought there was a lot less of that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Last week there was a lot yeah. less. Now, I know Stephanie is, is probably, it's probably part of... Of, of the sport to make sure that the fella, if you can get the opposition man put off. What do you think, la ladies, now, yourselves? What? We, to be fair, we, yeah. we don't really do it. I think no. it does happen a lot in the Premier League yeah. and in men's football, but I think if I was to dive, I feel like it'd just look obvious. <laughs> I yeah. can't, I yeah. can't throw myself on the yeah. ground unless I'm actually hurt. Yeah. And like what you're saying, you don't yeah. want people on the sideline watching thinking that you're actually seriously hurt. So yeah. for me, I've just never had it in me to dive. And I'd say, if I did, I'd just look awkward and people would be like, Steph, get up, will you? Like, <laughs> there'd never be any sort of, yeah. yeah I, no. I know sometimes you're going for a penalty or whatever it is. If you, if you can go down in the box, so be it. It might be the, it might be the win of the, of the game or not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but, no, 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 I understand where you're coming from. But yeah. I just think <laughs> girls in sports are a little bit more honest, I think, in terms yeah. of... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the big question, Louise. Why don't women cheat as much as men? <laughs> <laughs> so now you should probably tell us that, isn't it? No, no, I mean, Ted, take it away. <laughs> they do, but they're better at it. <laughs> not a dangerous <laughs> Dave. Oh, that's really Is it brave. Is brave. Huh? <laughs> you're brave. You're down underneath. You're very I think brave. you're in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be lucky to get out if you continue down that road. <laughs> Going back to the horse racing <laughs> angle, um, you are talking about the injuries there, and they're probably such a defining part of horse racing to the extent that when jockeys retire on one side of the page, you'll have the list of great races, and the other side, you'll have the long, lengthy list of injuries. And I wonder, Kate, is that part of the camaraderie that makes horse racing different, that there is that sort of caring it's, nature that I'm sure there's internal politics, I'm sure there's rivalries, I'm sure there's all that, but ultimately exactly. it seems everyone's yeah. sort of pulling along the same lines. Everyone like it's you. You, will, you agree with me, Katie? There's such camaraderie in the way room. Like it's in the way room. Everyone's best friends. It's like you know what they're going. You're going out there. What other sports do you have? Two ambulances following you around with horses going 40 miles an hour, and you know. But you leave your friends as you go out of that way room. And as Katie said before, you're all out there to win a race. But everyone's the best. Like you have your words and you go back into the way room, but there is such, because it's such a dangerous sport, there is that camaraderie and everyone will be, if someone got a bad fall, everyone will be, as Katie said already, will be there. Who is, who's, are they okay? Are they okay? But like, it's great, like what women have done 
in horse racing, I think especially this year is Rachel Blackmore like being contesting to be champion jockey against Paul Tain and she was it was a nice ding dong battle. She didn't get it this year, but it's only a matter of time for her. Yeah. And there's also the natural cycle of these things now that with the way the weights are going, that mm. there's probably going to be far more female jockeys over the coming decades. Exactly. And um, like as kind of, you know, the way the world is going around, we're all a bit better fed as we grow up a little bit more and everyone's a little bit heavier now. But the females, there's a good few females out there that are a lot lighter now and it's brilliant to see. And there's a good few really young girls coming through the flat racing now. They're all 10 pound claimers and it's great to see them getting a lot more rides. And I think this year in race, um, especially, it was 50-50 boys and girls, which has never happened before. Jessica, you spoke about the female trainers taking over. Like, are the pathways there for young female trainers who want to get involved? Is racing doing enough for them? I think they are. They, they're, they're getting there. But it, it, the trouble is, it's, you know, it's, it's very hard to get started. You have to be in the right place at the right time. You know, there's not, re there's not really any formal training to be a trainer other than you, you go to a big yard and you start off and you, just learn you, your trade. and you learn your trade and you have to learn it from the bottom up because you have to be able to do everything. You know, as Ted was laughing about drive, Katie driving the lorries, you know, I'm the only person other than the lorry drivers in my place who have a HGV license and I still get called upon occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> sit up Only behind the, the lorry car. wants to get a few dints in it now. Oh, well, it's no, a little bit up. big for you now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, but the difference is she owns it. Yeah, well, <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't I don't think matter. you're in a position but, to be slagging off about driving and very Oh, much. no, I know. That is true. Oh, that is true. But, but, you know, I think it is, you know, I think it, they will, I think lady trainers will come through I think there's a lot more of them starting to come through now. Because, well, Katie, you're sort of a trainer, but you're sort of looked after. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you're so yeah. A trainer. But if you, oh, but you, but I think what you, they should do now, is in a case rather like you, why can't we have joint trainers? You know, two like trainers, two people trainer. Like in Australia, they have two people that can train, you know, under under licensed license. under the two people. So it's not as much of a commitment. You know, it's all part of the commitment, like you, you and Ross could have it. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. and in France, they have it as well. I think yeah. they're starting it. Yeah, and uh, Frances Crowley, actually, she uh, always said that uh, she would have much preferred to be able to share the license with uh, her her father as well. Yeah. They should be able to double up the license. Yeah, but and listen. I think that, that would actually give many more opportunities. I saw, I was in Australia in uh, January and I was down there at sales. Uh, yearling sales and they have this amazing thing that um, for women owned horses there is a 250 gram bonus and it doesn't matter if your horse finishes last and there's only or say there's three horses in the race owned by women and they finish last, second last and third last. The first one gets 200 grand bonus, the second one gets 100 grand and the third one, the last horse gets a 50 grand bonus. Like, and that's the way down in Australia, they're using incentives to get women in yeah. to own horses. And I think if we got more women in as well to own horses, it might make it as well a little bit easier for, because the percentage of owners in owning horses in Ireland is majority male. So we got a few more women in, we might get a few more women trainers as well because it would um, snowball. Just before we wrap up this section, I was listening to Jessica talking about 50 years ago and women in racing and jockeys or jockettes and people having to take a stand and things changing. You look back now and wonder how it could have ever have been that way. Like 50 years time, we're talking about women's football and we're going, yeah, it was the time we couldn't even get track suits. Like, do you look back in last year and go, like, no matter what happens, and maybe we're back in another crisis and things need to happen again, but that you'll always be able to look back and go, you know what, when it came to it, we took a stand? Yeah, I think, I think for us it's still one of the, you know, the proudest and best things and the right thing that we've ever done. And there were some of the girls that really, you know, stood up for us there, the likes of, the likes of Emma Byrne, Anya O'Gorman were, you know, really took that forward for us, for the team, but everyone, everyone was there, everyone was backing us, everyone realised, and I think it was even for a little while where we kind of actually didn't realise about the whole tracksuit thing. That was probably I a smaller bit. That was just something that we knew would grab people's attention. Yeah, I think yeah. if we said to people, like, 
we don't have gym memberships or whatever it might have been. We knew that if people knew we had to get changed in airport toilets, that that would grab the attention and that would get the headlines and stuff like that. And we were advised, obviously, by, by people who would know that. But for me, I think it really brought us together as a team. I think we've always, always been a very, very close-knit team. Even young players who come in, they always join in the group straight away. But I think that's something that really made us stronger as a team. And I think going forward after that, we got the win against Slovakia straight away after. And I think it really did kind of bring us together closer on the pitch as well as off the pitch and we knew we kind of put pressure on ourselves I suppose because we knew we were going to have to get results because people were now looking at us in, in a new mm. way and people were actually coming out to watch us but it's kind of the, the pressure that we wanted yeah. we wanted to have people coming to our games and, and wanting to see us do well and it's something that something off the pitch has now brought us closer on the pitch and we hope that people will still continue to follow us and yeah. there's still you know teams and other women's teams and there's even you know some of the girls that are in the room who are still talked to it about you know that that you know that we did something that was that I think other other teams have have, have either wanted to do or want to do or are just you know we're we're very proud of the fact of of what we did and that's something that we want to take forward and for other teams and other women's teams to look to look at and be like you know this this is what you deserve and you need the the best, at least the best, like the facilities and things in place for you to perform your sports at it. Maybe, maybe we're not going to be the best, and that's sometimes in in terms of maybe winning medals or doing this and the other. But if we know that we've got everything there in place for us to try be the best, then you know that's yeah. the rest is down to us. Yeah, the rest, the rest is down to us then as athletes. Is, is, is there any woman uh, in charge of your sport in in, in any? position that could do any good for you the uh well or i was just about to say the the two world cup no. finalist teams were no, two no, mean here in ireland. No, yeah no i'm talking about in, in, no in, in ireland now in ireland we have our past manager sue was involved with 19s for us for a long time and then she's with the senior team for a long time as well and she's the women's direct or technical director mm. behind the scenes as well there are a couple of women within the fei but not enough in my opinion there's there's Eileen Gleeson who yeah. is our coach with P Mount who is now one of only uh, two or three who women who license, have their yeah. pro, pro license, license yeah. and you know she's she has an incredible mind for yeah. everything not even just for what's she's going on on the pitch but in the background more, and she's yeah. you know she's been she's been doing brilliant stuff and can be brilliant and she may well be your next manager who knows what will develop over the coming months. It's obviously a hugely important couple of months. Very best of luck with the new manager, with the game against the USA, with the eyes of the world on you, and I suppose most importantly with the start of the qualification campaign for the European Championship against Montenegro. My thanks, please give it up for our panel. <laughs> Louise Quinn, Stephanie Roach, Kate and Jessica Harrington, and Katie and Ted Walsh.